Well, I thought this was a fascinating section. Um, parts of it I had difficulty understanding, which, you know, with the stuff we've been reading is sort of par for the course. <laughs> Um, I, I, people say shelling is so hard. Um, I mean, this is not easy, but it's not, I don't think it doesn't seem to be any different, more difficult than phenomenology of perception or, uh, process in reality. Um, but there's, you know, there's parts I don't, I, I just frankly, they, they just get so complicated and so detailed. Um, I, I have a question that's really I don't know. Maybe we should, I'll ask it and then maybe we should just table it and then immediately and talk about it. I thought his, his, his idea of evil was pretty fascinating toward the end of this reading. Um, but I'm still having this struggle with, and again, I'm not sure if this, you guys need to tell me if this is the right word. I don't, I don't really know what transhumanism means, but what I'm associating it with, at least in part in my mind, is the sort of uh, contrary position to the phenomenological, at least some phenomenological uh, starting points. You know, so Husserl and then to some degree Heidegger and certainly Sartre, they start with this more or less Cartesian point where they say what we know best are the facts of consciousness. And so we should start with consciousness or in, in, in Heidegger's case, we should start with this, this engagement with the world, you know, this sort of first person engagement with the world. And then we should, because that's what we know best, then we should try to build our epistemology and metaphysics beginning there. And, you know, Merleau-Ponty, Merleau breaks that down and, and doesn't adopt that. And then, you know, Whitehead certainly doesn't. And then Deleuze certainly doesn't. And I'm wondering why, you know, why specifically Schelling, like in this section, he's, he's making the philosophy, what he calls the philosophy of nature as the primary topic of philosophy. Um, and it seems to me that's similar to some of these other people who, you know, who don't want to, because, I, and then he's, some of this is an explicit opposition or at least contrast to Fichte, who is, sort of, I guess, sort of a proto-phenomenologist. And Fichte says, you know, the beginning of, of knowledge is the self-positing I. That's where you have to start. And then you, you build out from there. Um, but, Schelling really thinks that's way wrongheaded and, and, and has this sort of, I don't know what to call it. I, again, I feel like I'm using these words incorrectly, but this sort of decentered metaphysics, decentered in the sense of you're not starting with human experience. You're starting with presuppositions or not presuppositions, but you're starting with ideas about, metaphysical ideas that are not grounded in human experience or human consciousness at first, or maybe I'm wrong about that, but you know, you, he's talking about the ground, then he's talking about God, and then he talks about how humans and individuality and consciousness emerge from that stuff. Again, kind of like uh, uh, Deleuze and um, Whitehead and people like that. So, I'm just curious as to why he's, why he's doing it that way. And I, I mean, I still, I still find this sort of first person beginning compelling because, um, you know, and I'm, I'm just rabbit, referring to Sartre here. He says one, one advantage of doing that is anything else is speculation. And um, I know Chase has said, so what the, what's the big deal about speculation? Good question. But, you know, Sartre's point is what I do know best is what I discover within my own immediate, the immediacy of my own consciousness. And then when I speculate, for example, when I say, well, my consciousness must be, must be a function of my brain and my physio, you know, my, my neurophysiology, he would say, that's an interesting hypothesis, but it's not one you could ever support empirically. 
you know, I'm well, you can support it, but you could, you could support it deduct or inductively, but you're only going to get inductive hypotheses. You could never get any immediate confirmation of that because, you know, you can't show that I cannot show that my own consciousness is a function of my own biology. I just can't do that. And so for that reason, he thinks that these, these theories that, that begin outside of that are always hypothetical and therefore, I guess, questionable. And, you know, you could have ver you could have various hypothetical theories grounded outside that frame of reference that could, could, you know, and this is probably the case where you can have multiple theories that all explain the facts of human experience and the, and the, the way, you know, the way we experience the world, and they could be mutually incompatible and yet mutually thoroughly uh, complete explanations. And so anyway, those are the sort of problems I, I worry about when I, or I think about when I read this kind of stuff. Yeah. So I think it's um, Schelling, he wants to, he definitely wants to use experience, although not as the, the sole starting spot. Um, but he also, so I guess that would be existence, you know, the, the concrete existence, which is a, and from there, it's kind of a, maybe a proto phenomenological kind of move but then he there's also this balance to that with the ground principle which is going to be so i think you would say that you know that approach of you know concrete consciousness and existence or whatnot that it also needs some kind of a, a ground structure like a that's where like a speculative metaphysics of the ground would come in to kind of account for it, although not in a way of a, a kind of reductive account, like, you know, it's just comes out of the brain, you know, not that kind of thing. So I think, yeah, he's definitely doing something more like um, Heidegger and Marie Ponty and Deleuze and Whitehead, I think at least, in the sense that he's it's definitely a kind of uh transcendental uh philosophy in the sense that he's talking about you know what are the conditions of this experience and that's you know the this these interplay of forces in the between the ground and existence and whatnot and yeah i, I think uh you can understand it from that angle um I guess uh, I can't remember exactly what else I was going to respond, but yeah, I have to say, I think this section was really interesting. It's definitely difficult, um, but it, it's, it's uh, you know, maybe comparable to the other books we've read, but it's really a different kind of style. Was, I think I've gotten quite used to the way that, uh, you know, like 20th century French philosophy kind of operates, but these Germans are like a whole different breed. They're, they think very differently. Like this, it, it was way more mystical and, you know, kind of mythological, I guess you could say, not in a despairing way, but um, much more uh, mystically oriented, I think, than I even thought it was going to be, and I even knew that he was influenced by, you know, Jakob Burma and Meister Eckhart and all these uh, German Rhineland mystics. But yeah, it was, uh, parts of it were very poetic, but um, yeah, I found it. So actually, I've, I have a somewhat a funny story, but um, so I was reading this last night and I was watching this YouTube stream video and they have this live chat where the, the chat icon just scrolls by so fast as everybody's just, you know typing spam stuff 
And I was like, I'm just going to put quotes from Schelling in here and say, like, someone explain this to me. And I started doing that. And at first, I didn't get any answers. Then finally, I put one and someone responded, it's a myth. <laughs> and I was like, oh, it's interesting, you know, considering you wrote a book about, you know, the philosophy of mythology. Um, yeah, I think that's that's significant. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how, but I I can see uh, how it relate. So, yeah, I'll just I'll stop there and see what's going on. I guess, uh, yeah, to speak to, to some of that, I, I had similar sort of reactions. I, um, I mean, I guess I'm relatively used to a kind of vaguely weird mythical uh, German talking to me about uh, random stuff. And the thing that I read uh, in between uh, uh, our sort of book club when I, when I didn't have anything else going on was this book called, um, let's see, I have it right here. The Great German Mystics, Eckhart, Tauler, and Suso. And I didn't actually finish it, but I read like the first half of it, which was about Eckhart and Tauler. Um, and, and what was very striking to me reading this is, is exactly how much this feels like um, an exercise in that kind of German, what was it's like, you know, 13th, 14th, 15th century mysticism, effectively. Um, I was kind of trying to place, I, I like I'm, I, I'm, I'm very theologically sympathetic to Spinoza. We'll, we'll put it that way. And so I'm interested in this question of, okay, well, what, what, what particular conception of God is, uh, is being argued for here by Schelling? And um, one thing that I, I think is kind of going on uh, here, I, originally I thought that he was, and I think this kind of came up in our, our last session, that he was arguing for a kind of, pantheistic god but the more that i'm reading it and the more that i'm seeing these echoes of of particularly eckhart um i i think um i think he's arguing for a much more traditional theological conception the the type of thing that um i, I interpret people to draw from whitehead i it seems to me that there's there's a kind of uh, similarity there in terms of the the building up of a kind of uh, both like a, a a kind of scientific um, or and in philosophical description, but but also like this emphasis on on um, a kind of poetic or mythical um, description, and and I think that it's not a pantheistic god in the sense that it's, um, I mean, it's almost something like what I've uh, heard talked about in terms of the Gnostics, um, which is always interesting, right, to kind of draw those lines between the the Gnostics and kind of I don't know post. They're like, like late medieval thought or like certain versions of like, you know, Catholic teachings. Um, I think that um, uh, I, I get this sensation of, yeah, Schelling is, is building us um, a certain kind of both metaphysical and mythological description. And there were parts where I was reading this um, that I didn't understand, but there were other parts where uh, uh, I had this sort of realization that uh, oh, this is like an interesting interpretation of like the Adam and Eve myth, or like I could see this as an interesting interpretation of the Adam and Eve myth in terms of what kind of relationship the individual has and what needs to happen in, in, in order for um, evil to be possible and for it to come into the world and for it to be knowledgeable effectively. Um, so I, I, you know, I, I think that I'm, I'm starting to get a better bead on like what Schelling's view actually is. Um, and uh, I don't know. It's interesting. <laughs> Just to maybe add a little bit to that, um, I totally see the point of Schelling and the mystics. Um, I'm not familiar with the German mystics like Eckhart and the rest, but I have had some time with some Polish Gnostics, and as well as Chase just pointed out, um, I was thinking a bit of Neoplatonism and maybe more about Proclus, who was like the third great uh, Neoplatonist. Platon, well, the second great Neoplatonist after uh, uh, Plotinus, um, but I can definitely see that sort of uh, myst mysticalization of God and being. Um, and if you even look at like where Gnosticism begins with uh, Marcion of Sino, um, his idea of the demiurge and its sort of being within the ground, I think uh, Schelling really 
talks about that in here. And I even have a quote that maybe goes along with this on page 27. Um, it's the bottom paragraph sort of in the middle. Um, it, the ground, is nature in God, a being indeed inseparable yet still distinct from him. This relation can be explained analogically through that of gravity and light and nature. Gravity precedes light as its ever dark ground, which itself is not actu, actual, and flees into the night as the light, that which exists, dawns. Even light does not fully remove the seal under which gravity lies contained. Um, so I guess that's it. I don't have another point to that, but I thought it sort of goes into what you were talking about with uh, connection perhaps with Gnosticism and Nietzsche. I'm curious as to what you guys are finding mythological, because I, maybe I was just translating uh, some, some of what you're thinking of as mythological language into metaphysical language, but it seems, I mean, he, he, want, he wants there to be a god, so yeah, I guess I could call that mythological, um, but, you know, he, he places this ground sort of, I don't know, in a way, ontologically prior to God, although he says it's not because they are somehow so, uh, mutually self-generating and and perpetuating. But I, I guess I don't, I don't, I don't understand the, the mythological thing because it seems like you've got this ground that somehow produces God, or God and it co-produce each other, and then also from this ground you have emerge, you know, pr particular beings emerging. Um, and then he explains the ontological relationship between God and the ground and the beings and the ground. And then, and I mean, he has to have that independence that, you know, he has to have that common ground for the two of them in order to preserve his notion of real freedom. Um, but it seems to me very much a, a metaphysical explanation rather than a mythological one. Um, so I'm not, I, I'm curious as to why, why you guys, where you're finding the mythology. So, I mean, part of what I was interpreting as mythological is that, that whole story. And, and I think that the reason why I maybe perceive that as mythological is because of some, a small amount of familiarity with, with Gnosticism and with some of the ways that it, it talks about religion. And it like, I guess like sort of point taken in the sense that the Gnostics in the way that they describe creation and they're, the Gnostics aren't like a unified group. So right, we could, we could mention lots of different accounts here, but, but most of the accounts that I'm familiar with have this weird quality of being kind of intermediate between a mythology and a, and a, and a mystical sort of mythological explanation because they do talk about, um, you know, beings and entities going through processes um, you know, in the same way that a, a mythological creation story might talk about, you know, God moving over the deep or something like that, like, you know, as we read it in the Bible. Um, but it is also, it's much more obscure and it's much more difficult to, to understand, which is, which is why I think the temptation to talk about it as um, uh, metaphysics makes sense to me. But I, I think it's a, it's a little bit of both. It's a little bit like, like Plato telling us the story of the Demiurge right, working with clay, and it's like, well, that's a, that's a legitimate metaphysical explanation of what's going on, but it has this, this mythological component to it. It's this thing where the, the, um, the story isn't necessarily in, in need of a literal explanation as much as it is, it's attempting to guide you towards a certain kind of um, uh, religious and intellectual sensitivity, if that makes sense. Well, I, I don't see, I, I don't see much, well, I don't see methodologically, I guess, a lot of difference, like that's, that can't be right. Anyway, there seem to me to be very strong parallels between Schelling's approach and Whitehead's approach. Um, and, you know, in the end, Whitehead doesn't make this distinction between, I guess, the ground and God, you know, he sort of make, it creates an identity there. So you have this this God, this, in, this, I don't know what you want to call it, but this ground of existence that gives rise to phenomena, and this ground of existence has some certain fundamental properties 
uh, that explain why existence rises in the way it arises in the way it does. And it seems to me Schelling's doing something very similar, except that he has a print a principle that is almost ontologically prior to God. But I, I mean, I you know maybe he's using Gnostic and Neoplatonic uh, tropes here, but in terms of metaphysics. I don't know, it just seems to be, again, similar to something like Whitehead. Yeah, so I think the, um, with the mythology description, I, so the way I would describe it as, you know, similar to mythology, well, Shonda, I think, did a pretty good description of that, and somewhat similar to the Timaeus, uh, Plato, which he calls, you know, a, a likely story, a, a likely mythos, mythos. And he actually draws uh, some from the Timaeus, uh, in particular that notion of, so the prima materia is this kind of, you know, chaotic, um, you know, primal soup of forces in which there's kind of a, a random motion and whatnot. There's so this is actually what Phil Kadic calls the the irrational um, mind of God, and so this is where uh, Phil Kadic gets a lot of he gets a lot of his Gnosticism, or at least he gives it like some kind of like intellectual support by drawing on the Timaeus and this account of the the Godhead having some kind of irrational aspect at the base of it. And uh, the thing, though, is, um, you know, he talks a lot about Neoplatonism and Gnosticism. And really what I think what he's talking about at first um, is this, uh, the problem of emanation. And, and he's talking about these emanationist ideas and their accounts of evil. And he's showing that they don't really make sense in that they can't account for evil as a as a real thing while also accounting for freedom and god's um omnipresence uh, or, or omnipotence more so omnipotence and also his omnibenevolence is that he's a perfectly good being so basically all those, you know, qualities are things that all these people are trying to make. And he goes through and, you know, he talks about um, these dualistic ideas where I, I see something kind of like a, something like a critique of Kant, I think, in there. So he's saying that there's one kind of not of dualism that is kind of like the, what is he call? He has a really interesting term. Um, Oh, here it is. Yeah. The self-destruction and despair of reason, basically the inability for reason to account for things. And I think that's why, you know, he believes in a reason in the sense that it's able to, you know, give some kind of a, a, a mythos to a story, a likely story to these things. And then there's the dualism that's like a Gnosticism where they try to explain evil as, oh, there's this other aspect of, you know, reality that's cut off from the good, and that's the source of evil. But then, of course, okay, where does this, uh, you know, evil come from? Where does this irrational aspect come from? Basically, you can't have both a, a kind of all powerful, all good God, and then at the same time have some kind of area that's like cut off from him, cut off from his, his power and his goodness or whatever. So, and then the other thing he kind of gives an account for is um, he shows how these, uh, that kind of Gnostic dualism really necessitates a kind of emanationism that it all has to come from that one principle of reality. And then he shows how that doesn't really account for it either. And 
So this part I thought was really interesting. And um, his, uh, so Plotinus and his idea of evil is actually somewhat different than I remember. Because I, I remembered it basically essentially being a kind of privation, but it, it seems like it's a little more complex than that. Um, although I think he would say that ultimately it's kind of the same idea that all these ideas are ultimately to put evil into a metaphysical system, they're having to use this idea of, of privation. And the thing about these, uh, so he gives this critique of, of emanationism, of Neoplatonism, of Gnosticism, but yet he gives his own account and I see that he's doing something similar. And, you know, we've all, it seems like kind of noticed the similarity there with, you know, the Neoplatonism and, and Gnosticism. And I'm wondering if he can really, if his account really can withstand his own criticisms in a sense. And that, so he seems to be, what's special about his account is that there is this kind of ground that is uh, ultimately in a sense kind of separate from God but yet God is causing it and it's within God and he basically uses this kind of um, you know admittedly circular kind of logic um, and when I first read this I was just like what what like what is let me see if I can find what page that's on but it's um I think it's 20, 28, maybe. Yeah, 28. So I'm wondering, is this where he differs from those accounts of, you know, like a, a Neoplatonic kind of idea of emanationism or, or dualism? And that and is this because he's still really trying to hold on to this idea of God as something that is, you know, at least has some kind of good principle in it and also has some kind of, you know, omnipotence, but yet also has a, a, a kind of ground of, um, of evil in it as well. So I'm wondering if you guys think that this kind of circularity that he's talking about, does that really distinguish him from his own kind of critiques of Neoplatonism? I guess that's kind of what I'm wondering. I think maybe on later on in page 28, he sort of talks about where his system uh, differs from maybe a Neoplatonic or a agnostic point of view. Um, this is in the second paragraph, sort of towards the middle again. Um, let's see. Since, however, nothing indeed can be outside of God, this contradiction can only be resolved by things having their ground in that which in God himself is not he himself. Um, and then there's a little asterisk there. In the sense that one says the logic of the enigma, um, that is, in that which is the ground of his existence. If we want to bring this way of being closer to us in human terms, we can say it is the yearning the eternal one feels to give birth to itself. The yearning is not the one itself, but is after all co-eternal with it. And I know he later goes on uh, later in the reading um, and talks about this yearning. Um, and so I think that's really important in his process, it seems. Um, that's what I got. Well, I, I don't know how much of this could be just criticized as metaphysical um, mumbo jumbo. You know, I mean, I, I, I actually find it kind of compel or not compelling. I, I like kind of like what he says, but you know, like Hume says, um, claims that metaphysicians say all these things that just don't make any damn sense. And, you know, just because you can say it in words doesn't mean that it actually makes any sense. But, you know, that passage that Jackson was just reading, it's, I mean, the one, capital O, oh, thank you. The one seems to be this 
ground that is in some sense ontologically prior to God. Um, and then God is, and then there's this yearning that is not identical to the one, but is somehow co-eternal with it. And I don't know really what that means. Um, I mean, because if it is the one, then you would, it seems like you would want everything to be somehow it. Um, and so I'm not sure how he can say that that's not, I mean, that's not a kind of dualism. But if we say that it's not a kind of dualism, that somehow this yearning is co-eternal with the one and yet not ontologically distinct from it, then that yearning, uh, the yearning is not, the one itself, but is co-eternal. The yearning wants to give birth to God. That is unfathomable unity. And so, and then the, the yearning, he seems to identify with the will. And then a lot of this then begins to start to sound, sound like Schopenhauer. But, you know, so I, I mean, I, I can see where the words would would say that it's it's not the same thing because, and I, I don't know Neoplatonism well, but my general sense is that what is that whatever is the source of emanation is the divine, whereas here it's like whatever is the sor the ultimate source is not exactly the, the divine, but the divine is in fact a manifestation of it. You know, so there's this yearning, somehow. I don't know, the same as or different from, I'm not sure, the one. And this yearning is the yearning to give birth to a kind of unity that, that, that the one lacks, apparently. And so, you know, the, the one has this, multi, this ra perhaps radical multiplicity, maybe pure difference, I don't know. And, and it, but it, it wants to give birth to something that, ha that has unity and that will to, that will to unity then manifests as this deity. And so it, it, it seems to be different in that the, again, I, I may, may not be understanding Neoplatonism, but that this, the divine principle in some sense emerges from the, the one, which is not itself the divine principle. So I don't know if Neoplatonism has anything like that where there is uh, a divine principle that emanates from something that's prior to it. And then, you know, then we find out, I mean, we find out or we've, we've known that implicit in the one is also the, the principles that can ultimately give rise to evil as well. I don't know if, if Neoplatonism has that either. I really don't know. Yeah, I don't think it really does. And um, so his, uh, his description of Neoplatonism was actually interesting because it definitely seems to, now that I remember, it seems to go against the idea that it's just a privation kind of thing because it says that, you know, okay, the, well, first of all, I think there's kind of, there's totally different spatial uh, analogies going on in the sense that Platonism is all about this idea of height and you know the first principle is the highest principle and from that height there's just this downward emanation literally like a flowing out and he says that you know this first principle of the good you know capital G for Plato and Plotinus and whatnot um, you know, that is good. And then everything that comes out of that is like this diminishment of the good until you get to matter, which is in one sense, it's the, <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't even gotten to Deleuze yet. Hold on. So there's the matter as the emanation <laughs> um, that is in one sense, the what does he say? Like the end of its productive capability to produce anything new. And then is also itself nothing that is good. So it's interesting that you have, okay, ultimately this first principle of the good, you know, value itself and then creation and all of its creative force, the good can only bring about a diminishment of itself into its complete opposite, which is, 
but is entirely not good. That seems like a ridiculous metaphysics, uh, I don't know, at least when I, you count it that way. So I think that's uh, at least that shows that uh, what they were doing wasn't simply saying like, oh, yeah, evil is just kind of like a shadow. Uh, it, it's really nothing, you know, really the only thing that exists is the light. Well, that's not really very, uh, you know, satisfying either. But I think then um, what he's doing differently is he has this idea, um, okay, the ground isn't going to be, you know, from this, this first principle that's at the, at the top of everything that emanates down. Instead, he's drawing on, you know, Eckhart and Burma. And instead, there's going to be this like, ungrund, this, uh, you know, abyss or something from within. And now the spatial metaphors have changed from, you know, this uh, highest principle is no longer the highest principle. It's the innermost principle. And it comes out of that. And I think he's drawing on those ideas much more than, you know, these Neoplatonic ideas in that sense. But he, his thing seems to be that he's saying that, um, okay, yes, God comes from this ground, but then there's not one thing that precedes the other one. And at first, it didn't really make any sense to me. And, you know, I put it in the little, uh, the YouTube chat, and that's when somebody said, like, it's a myth. <laughs> But uh, this one sentence I read started to make sense to me in that he's talking about a kind of like mutual relational kind of uh, co-arising of things, which, you know, I, I love these ideas. So I'm just going to read this. Uh, so he says, here there's no first and last because all things mutually presuppose each other. No thing is another thing. And yet no thing is not without another thing. So basically he's, he's saying that, yeah, the, the ground of that existence, which is different from that existence, but at the same time, it's, it, they need each other in this kind of mutual relation. So you've got, uh, you know, this kind of relational ontology. And then also there's this process that comes about from the yearning and the desire and okay here's where the delusian aspect of my brain uh started you know firing off because this yearning is a kind of difference from you know this absolute identity of that is god and yet it's a difference that is trying to differentiate itself into what it's not so uh, you could definitely see how someone could say that this is this is a kind of difference in itself kind of thing this ground as you've got this connection with desire difference and then a process of self-differentiation out of which comes you know existence i mean with a little bit of uh you know faith from other people i could give the i could basically say that this would map onto uh the loses ideas of difference and like a transcendental ground uh pretty well so that's a pretty interesting aspect but then that it works within this um uh, this notion of a kind of process of of desire and yearning that at the same time is in this kind of relational sort of mutual presupposition of each other. And this is kind of how he's trying to show that um, there is a kind of identity relationship with the ground and existence with God and this ground and evil and good and all these things are, are together through this mutual presupposition and this, these processes of, of arising and whatnot. But I think it goes back to kind of what he was talking about towards the very beginning 
about you know the the copula of is and a being so basically when he's saying is as an absolute identity he's basically not giving like a it doesn't just mean a complete equivalency it means basically a kind of mutual coming together of opposites in some way and that's what's kind of unique about this and ultimately i think this is kind of his main point in a lot of ways so okay i'm going to see what you guys think of that um first off first off okay my mic is right here. uh yeah um i just i'm sorry new space um i wanted to i, I want to like it's in the laptop oh sh oh god see that's what i'm saying i'm gonna be talking into my crotch thinking that i'm being heard uh okay <laughs> so here's the deal um basically i i i there are a lot of things to respond to <laughs> there are a lot of uh a lot of things that i wanted to address first i i i I saw some different, just way back to the beginning of this discussion, we were talking about Sartre. Uh, I, I feel like there were parts in this reading where I was like, you know, this, he was calling out Sartre before Sartre even had a chance. You know, he, there were certain parts of this where it felt like he was, he was, because I feel like, like Sartre, at least in comparison to somebody like Schelling, like, like how we said, like Schelling's process or Schelling's methodology, something akin, I'm going to say akin to, or has familial relations to things like, Deluge and to and to um, Whitehead and so on. I think it's different from Sartre in the sense that he, I feel, uh, he would say that Sartre is kind of a passive fan of estrangement, a fan of passive estrangement and detachment from good and evil and the abolition of good and evil. Uh, you know, uh, and and that's why I even wrote down. Well, technically, Sartre does kind of resort to honesty. He does change the, the the topic from evil and good to honesty and authenticity. So, may, so you know, I really felt it was almost kind of it's like Schelling kind of predicted this or saw this strain of thought that produced Sartre or Sartrean thought. Um, but what I really wanted to get into, what I really wanted to, to actually respond to, was um, I wanted to address two things. First off, uh, I, I there's this. I want to talk about evil here and yearning and where we're getting at as we're talking about yearning and what, where, what would I have used to make it make sense because it's very difficult and dense German idealism and I'm trying to make it make sense. And a part of that, there's something that I wanted to point out that has to do with Hegel because I, I, I have to bring him up one. Yeah! <laughs> All right. So that's <laughs> uh, my only trick. Uh, so here's the, th okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be using page 29 as my my yeah my it takes a shot <laughs> I'm going to be using page 29 as my primary like ground for my argument so to speak uh, I think that on page 28 he starts talking about this separation between uh, the this 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 is the, the nothing that can be outside of God contradiction can only be resolved by things having their ground and that which God is not himself that is just what that was in bleh, that is in that which is the ground of his existence and then he he specifies that if we want to bring this way of being close to us in human terms we can say it is the yearning the eternal one and that's going to be important feels to give birth to itself right there's an eternal or there's a yearning of the eternal one to give birth to itself uh, and he begins to explicate this over the next page and a half and basically things have a ground outside god or 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 in a way that's something that things have a ground that's not quite god it's not quite god it is the ground of god and it's the ground of of god the ground of the eternal one which we maintain contact with we don't maintain contact with god or the one or the absolute all the time except for perhaps in in obscene moments that zizek argues Schelling would, would believe in but rather we maintain contact with the ground of god in this yearning in this this thing that he keeps calling yearning and i was really obsessed with this with this yearning and i think that he makes it very explicit on page 29 so, so about 
one fifth of the way from the top of the paragraph, there's a sentence that starts after the eternal act of self revelation. I think that he starts a really, 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 really important thing here. He says the, after the eternal act of self revelation, everything in the world is as we see it now rule order and form. So after an eternal act of self revelation, like identity or, or finding identity or self identifying, there's rule order and form, but anarchy still lies eyes in the ground, this ground of God, as, as if it could break through once again. And nowhere does it appear as if order and form were what, 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 were what is original, but rather as if initial anarchy had been brought to order. This is the incomprehensible base of reality and things, the indivisible remainder. And that's, I think, a really important phrase. That which with the greatest exertion cannot be resolved in understanding but rather remains eternally like in the ground. And, and he begins on this larger argument from that notion of the ground and of the darkness, the, this, this description of evil, which I really want to get into in a second here. But, but basically, if I, can, if I can make sort of a, like a, like a, a conjecture or like, a, like you know, a motion to the group, I, I want to put forward that when I recognize this description of the ground that he's giving, the ground of God, the ground of being, all this, the ground of the eternal one seeking to give birth to itself, the yearning, I see it as, or I read it as the gap, this permanent anarchy, this eternal indivisible remainder, this insolvable bifurcation, this, this irreducible problem, this dilemma, this gap this permanent deficiency in our form, orders, and rules, this imminent, permanent problem, right? And, and the way that he describes that imminent, permanent problem that's embodied in the ground is with yearning. Our experience of that imminent embodied problem in the ground is yearning. And this yearning, as far as I can tell, as long as it is the anarchy which still lies in the ground as if it could break through once again and nowhere appearing as if order and formal were the original but rather as if anarchy had been brought to order right this incomprehensible base this i mean and especially after the eternal act of self-revelation this yearning reads to me almost exclusively as as a term that i heard once um called the the imminent circle of self-reference the imminent circle of self-reference the the heart of perversion the, the center of subjectivity, which is divorced from empirical reality, right? What the, 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 like what we talked about earlier, Edgar Allan Poe and his notion of the imp of perversion. In his story, I found out the stories, by the way. Uh, the, 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 the story is actually called the imp of, per of perversion, and another story is called the black cat. But there's this character called the spirit of, of perverseness or of perversion who talks about the imminent circle of self-reference. He doesn't say it like that, but he says that there's an internal divorced from reality impulse or urge or feeling or inclination and what, what this is what Hegel would call speculative thinking that produces an uh, to this this drive to go against the order of things merely out of the fact that the order of things is such I am told that I have to be a certain way I am given some sort of form that I am a certain way Life is a certain way, but but Sartre and Hegel and and Zizek and Baidu even would stand by the fact that reality is not what it is. Reality is what things aren't. There's there's a gap. There's a permanent gap between what something is and that thing. There's a permanent gap between my immediate conception of that thing and the reality of that thing, and the words in my conception and the words in that thing. There's just these constant in like non traversable chasm that separate thoughts and concepts and objects. And I think that this introversible, this series of, of, of non-traversable chasms, these, these cataclysmic breaks and, 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 and cracks. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the thing. But that, that's the thing. Onto, okay, so Chase just said ontological incompleteness as the tension of unity and division. Uh, uh, unity and its divisions. I, I, wanna, I wanna, this is what, that's a perfect way to lead me into evil. And this is kind of my last point. It's, it's that, it's that <clears throat> this primal anarchy, this gap, this ground, this, this 
indivisible remainder which serves as the ground of God by producing a space for that beyond appearance. The ground as a gap produces a space for things beyond appearance and therefore opens up a space for God and therefore is the ground of God. Even, even in like a Lacanian sense, it's like the ground of God. I, I think that there's another page, I forget what page it's on, but he's talking on, on uh, a later page about evil, evil and he defines it as selfhood seeking independence. I know that you guys probably know what I'm talking about um, because it's somewhere in like the 30s, I think, or something. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, uh, no, never mind. Oh, wait, yes, on 38, I, I think, uh, yes, 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 yes. But in, on the top of 38, here's my yes. In this regard, <laughs> it, it, on the very top, in this regard, it is to be noted that inertia itself cannot be thought of as a mere deprivation. Uh, but actually as something positive, something as, namely as expression of the internal selfhood of the body, the force whereby it seeks to assert its independence. We do not deny that metaphysical finitude can be made comprehensible in this way, but we deny that finitude for itself is evil. So he's making a point there. Evil is the expression of internal selfhood seeking to assert independence. That seeking to assert independence is a yearning to assert a unity. That is the, the eternal one attempting to give birth to itself. That, that expression of internal selfhood seeking to assert independence is the drive to for the eternal one to give birth to itself. But the problem with the one, the greatest problem with the one is its ground. It's the fact that the one is permanently stuck as this thing that can never be what it is. The one can never be what it is. And Hegel explicates this later by saying that the one is a non-one, a non-one in an active sense, not just that it's beyond oneness, but that it is actively against oneness. And, and I'll, I'll, I guess I can get into that if I need to, but my, the reason I bring it up is because I feel like Schelling is very insistent on evil as an active non-good. He talks about evil as it's not just the lack of goodness. It's not a deprivation. It's not a privation. It's not just a, a missing quality that we are giving some positive attribute and that positivity is evil. He's saying that evil itself has a positivity. That this evil, this evil is an active non-good. An active non-good born out of the yearning yearning that exists within ground that gave space for God. This yearning produces a space wherein it is a full on, it is a, it is a, it is a, it is a fully possible reality in all possible realities for evil to start churning within the space of the ground, within the space of the yearning. And, and if I can be honest, I think that this yearning and this ground and this space and this all this, it's only possible because of subjectivity. It's only because it's only thing because there's a subject here. But but that's beside the point. My point is that evil as an active non-good, this totally positive reading of evil, we can give evil, as this active going against the good, actively fighting against, you know, <clears throat> this this light connected to selfhood or raised to spirit or whatever. This evil arises from a dark principle in the centrum, with an enthusiasm or a spiritedness. That's what, that's what Schelling says. And this evil is a way of being. It's just, a, it's not like a, he, he, he explicates it at certain points as well. I forget what page it's on, but, but he, he, he's explicit that evil has no inherent being. It doesn't exist anywhere, but in like this realm of appearance, it oscillates between being and non-being. It, it only makes itself felt, sort of like a disease. You know, uh, uh, evil is just a way of being. We, we're not just, but is a way of being, a form of being, which is born out of, I, and now this is a word that I'm just planting in here. I would call it like hubris. I would call it hubris in the face of the yearning. It'd be, it'd be a, a, a subject's approach to yearning or experience of yearning and interpretation or, or, or application of that yearning as a hubris or, or uh, you know, as an embodiment of its hubris, of a desire to find unity. And, and here's my huge problem with the whole thing. And it's that, it's that I, I, I like all this. I'm with him so far, right? We're all with him up to this point in the argument. But I have one problem that I want to kind of put forward to you guys. And it's that there is a lot of stuff here 
in especially on page on page 31 there's a problematic notion that i feel like we have to address at least that i would really like to address so that i can sleep tonight uh and it's called awakening so so on page 31 on page 31 he makes this point we can agree that there's this this primal anarchy and stuff and there's this permanent gap and this this circle of imminent self-relation and yearning and so on but my problem exists here on page 31 he talks about this idea of awakening so let's i want to just read from like okay the first the start of the first sentence on page 31 where it says since therefore since therefore the understanding or the light placed in primordial nature arouses the yearning that is striving back into itself to divide the forces for the surrender of darkness while emphasizing precisely in this division the unity closed up within the divided elements this is where he's talking about division or, or, or dissimilarity is just a series of, of, of imperfect divisions or unities the hidden glimpse of light something comprehensible and individuated first emerges in this manner and indeed not through external representation rather through genuine impression since that which arises in nature is impressed into her still more correctly through awakening since the understanding and this is where he's basically turning like translating what he just said into english through awakening since the understanding brings to the fore the unity or idea hidden in the divided ground right the force the force is split up but not fully really dispersed in this division for the, uh, uh, the material form which the body is subsequently configured the vital bond which arises in division thus from the depths of the natural ground as a center of forces however is the soul okay so 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 if i can point out like my, my actual problem with here with this here it's that it's that he points out that this that, that that at one point he points out that evil is this selfhood seeking independence and it's this evil is is this exercise toward unity in yearning okay if we can agree evil is a is a striving towards a towards a unity in yearning okay my problem is that i am concerned about this awakening and in fact, his notion of the soul in general and its, its distance or its definitive space from such an exercise of yearning. I am worried that his conception of awakening and of spirit and of the soul, in some sense, give up uh, too much ground to... <clears throat> the very thing that he calls evil, the very thing that he calls an impulse towards unity within yearning. <clears throat> and and my, my basic argument is that from that is that <clears throat> the awakening is, is the event where the understanding brings forth unity hidden in the divine ground, right? And, and the soul or the vital bond, right, is what connects those ideas right? Am I, sorry, am I cutting out or something? Um, <laughs> my, my point <laughs> is that this, this, see, 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 yeah, this searching for a unity and this vital bond, they sound very similar to Hegelian ideas. They sound very similar to, to what people accuse Hegel of thinking. It sounds like what people accuse Hegel of, which is this, this, dialectical movement of concepts into this infinite absolute approach towards the absolute in this in this march of progress toward toward absolute knowing or the absolute idea you know like people accuse hegel of having these rigid forms or this structure that things fall into and and in fact i would say that not only that but but Schelling's use of soul and vital bond as this thing which connects opposites, this thing which lets us connect divisions and see through divisions and see unity in divisions, the soul or the vital bond, that sounds very similar to Geist, which is what Hegel argues is soul, spirit, Geist, the thing inside of us, the mind, that is a speculative unity of the opposites, okay? The problem, the difference, that I think is like 
it's absolutely critical to understanding the cut between Schelling and Hegel is that for Hegel, for Hegel's spirit, the spirit in Hegel sees antagonism between two things, right? Hegel's spirit does not see this antagonism as permanently struggling opposites. Hegel does not see these as, as opposite determinations in a permanent struggle in some infinite eternal tension. That is in no way what Hegel is arguing for. What Hegel is arguing for, or, or the idea that he's putting for, is that antagonism is the fundamental structure of an object or concept by itself. An object or concept by itself, imminently, within its own being, or its own becoming, it retains and it expresses at a certain point its own imminent self-negation and inconsistencies. It is not that it recognizes two things as being opposite and that's fine. It's that it sees one thing and recognizes the imminent self-negations, inconsistencies, and incongruencies within the concept itself, okay? And, and, and the reason that this is important is that it, 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 it establishes Hegel's version of reconciliation versus Schelling's notion of awakening. Schelling's version of awakening to me reads like a, a discovering of a unity within division. Hegel's reconciliation reads to me as seeing the chaos and the antagonism and the problems, the division itself, the very division in itself as the system, as the, 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 the motion of concepts as uh, in all determinations of thought, as the movement of spirit, you know? There's not, a, there's not a unity that's being constructed necessarily. I feel like for Schelling, there is kind of a unity that's being constructed, at least unless I'm, unless I'm off my rocker, unless, I, unless I've completely lost the plot and the phrase the understanding brings to the fore the unity or idea hidden in the divided ground totally does not mean what I think it means. And, and, and so unless I'm completely confused, which I, I, I hope I am, because I want to, you know, find Schelling more, you know, get, get, get deeper into it, find real problems, you know, if this is just an illusion. But, but that's my problem, and I hope that that problem makes sense, you know. Nothing makes sense. We're all trapped in this absurd... Uh, Let's see, so I don't, there's like, uh, there's a lot of things that I wanted to say in uh, response to that. Um, actually, you know, I'm, I'm gonna see if anyone else wants to go before me so I can uh, maybe gather exactly what I wanna say in return other than nothing makes sense and everything's absurd or whatever. I'll make a few comments. I, I, uh, I have a tenuous grasp on what Hunter was saying. And it's not because what you were saying was, um, there was that there was anything wrong with it. It was just that, you know, it was like trying to drink out of a fire hose. So and there was a lot of, in, in, no, no, it's fine. I mean, you know, that's what, yeah. <laughs> that's what uh, students feel like in my lectures sometimes. So. Um, no, but I think that I, I'm having a hard time retaining the difference between Hegel and, and Schelling. I mean, you expressed it well, but I'm having a hard time, re, you know, keeping it in the forefront of my mind. So I'll get, just bring up some things that sort of popped into my mind while you were talking. Um, so, which probably isn't going to answer your question as to whether, you know, whether your interpretation of Schelling is correct or not, but, and, and troubling. But, so it seems to me that the, the very ground itself, the one, I guess, is inherently multiplicity. Again, I, I don't know, but I want to say it's something like Deleuze's pure difference, but there's, the ground itself is inherent multiplicity, and yet it is one. And so there's somehow like, you know, like the, I forgot that I can't, I'm not finding the passage that you read, but there's this sort of implicit unity there. And yet it is inherently 
diverse and it is somehow the yearning combined with the understanding or the understanding motivated by the yearning or something there is this yearning for unity you know because he says when he's talking about god uh, the yearning wants to give birth to god that is unfathomable unity so it sounds like the yearning is a yearning for unity and yet the ground itself is is diversity and so you have this built in you know so the, maybe the build the fundamental tension is right there in the one you know and again i i don't exactly know what he means at the bottom of 28 when he says the yearning is not the one itself but uh but it is after all co-eternal with it i still don't really know what that means but it sounds like the primordial principle slash principles are this diversity of of the one and this yearning for unity and then those principles manifest for example in this the birth of god and so like god is this birth of unity or the birth of a striving toward unity something like that and then when a when a that unity is a manifestation, or that unity, man, or not the unity, the diversity manifests, I think, in the diversity of human passions and so on. And so, he said, to me, he sounds a lot like Nietzsche on page 34, when he says the human will, this is a, more or less in the middle of 34, the human will is to be regarded as the bond of living forces. Now, as long as it remains in unity with the universal will, these same forces exist in divine measure and balance. But no sooner than self-will itself moves from the centrum as its place, so does the bond of forces as well. In its stead rules a mere particular will that can no longer bring the forces to unity among themselves as the original will could, and thus must strive to put together or form its own peculiar life from the forces that have moved apart from one another. An indignant host of desires and appetites, since each individual force is also a craving and an appetite, this being possible insofar as the first bond of forces, the first ground of nature itself, persists even in evil. But since there can be indeed no true life like that which could exist only in the original relation, a life emerges which, through individ though individual, is, however, a uh, false, a life of mendacity, a growth of restless restlessness and decay. The most fitting comparison here is offered by disease. And then he talks about the analogy of disease. Um, and then at the top of 35, even particular disease disease emerges only because that which has its freedom or life only so that it may remain in the whole strives to be for itself and so it, it sounds like the the issue is something that, that, that there are these potentialities in the human spirit for and, and, and again, he, he's at some point he ascribes, you know, wh why does, well, back on, on 34 toward the bottom, um, I, meant, I already read this, the most fitting comparison here is offered by disease, which as the disorder of having arisen in nature through the misuse of freedom is the true counterpart of evil or sin. So that sounds like a sort of traditional Christian notion of, you know, uh, somehow it's the misuse of, of freedom or misuse of the will that produces evil. But it sounds like there's this multiplicity in the ground that is reflected in the multiplicity of, of human passions and desires and instincts and drives, which again sounds a lot like Nietzsche. Um, and that there is a potential that, that 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 it sounds like what he's saying is that the individual particular human being can never um, integrate that dis, that multiplicity into a healthy into you know entity the only way to do that is to ground that willing in this sort of primordial will which i'm assuming is going to connect to something like a relation to god and and that is the only way that you can maintain unity or be good is by grounding your particular will in this primordial will but if you try to bud off in a sense you know you try to 
to become a little bud on your own and break your will, break your your in, internal uh, fragmentation and break it off into a single into something that is independent of the ground. That's when you get evil, and it's and I'm I'm assuming he's going to say like you can't really pull that off. You end up with this diversity that just produces terrible things. And all of this reminds me of Nietzsche in Kierkegaard. So, you know, Nietzsche, I would think in, in contrast to Schelling says, yeah, no, you're right. Exactly. We are this constant mul multiplicity of forces, but that if, but that if you have a so-called dominating instinct, you can in fact create a unified personality from that diversity. So you don't have to go to return to some sort of eternal ground to do that. On the other hand, you know, uh, Kierkegaard claims, you know, we are this, this, um, I don't know if he used the word unity, but we're this, the, the spirit is this unity of opposites. But again, the only way to maintain the integrity of this unity is to ground that in a third thing, namely in God. And so it, it sounds to me like, you know, I, I'm getting these sort of Kierkegaardian, Nietzschean, Nietzschean themes here perhaps um, regarding the sort of in the, 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 the effort to integrate the diversity of human consciousness and in Sartre, or sorry, in, in Kierkegaard's and Schelling's telling, it seems like you can't really do that unless you ground that somehow in this divine principle. Whereas Kierkegaard says, no, you, you can do that. You don't need this divine principle. Yeah, so that part I thought was really significant, or at least it helped me to get a better grasp of the overall concept he was going for. Although I'm still somewhat confused because, so he says that, um, you know, there's this primal will and then there's you know individual particular wills and the problem is when the particular will kind of takes it upon its its own to to universalize its own particular will and instead there there's kind of um a sort of i don't know inherent normativity to uh, the resonance with of the particular will with the the universal will, which sounds kind of like uh, Kant, I guess. But so yeah, uh, I said in the chat that it reminds me of Alistair Crowley. I don't, I don't know if anyone knows who that is, but um, it's kind of like a modern occult of like magical practice kind of thing and his idea is that the will is this is this kind of special metaphysical principle uh this creative principle and the idea of religious practice is to kind of transform your own will into uh this kind of synchronization with the primal creative will of the universe and this is also done through a kind of what they call a, a conversation with the the guardian angel or what is it called something like that the conversation with your own uh holy guardian angel and it uses a bunch of language like that but that kind of reminds me of what Schelling is talking about with this idea of the word he uses, you know, obviously that's kind of like the logos. Um, yeah, <laughs> uh, I wasn't quite sure what he meant by those ideas of the of the word, but I think because of he only kind of initially uh, touched on it, that he's probably just giving us a, a hint at it, that it works as a kind of a seed, but yeah, the, the big thing I think that helped me to realize what he's talking about with, with evil is 
this part on uh, 38 where he's saying that, uh, yeah, that finitude itself is not evil. That's not the problem, which, you know, Leibniz and all these other metaphysicians previously, that was basically their concept that it's just, you know, the diminishment, the privation of being, that's what evil is, and therefore something positive. But instead he's saying basically that it's kind of these uh, incomplete divisions, if they're taken as a kind of false unity, that that's where this kind of disharmony and imbalance occurs and I think that notion of a false unity was definitely uh, that helped me to recognize, I think, what he's kind of talking about in terms of a disharmony. And also it goes with the whole notion that he's talking about with this idea of uh, that the particular will taken as a universal in itself, that becomes a kind of false unity. Or we can see it also in the sense of, um, you know, taking the human idea of good as the sole idea of good. Or uh, using the speakerphone in the library so that you can hear the person you're talking with better. And then making everyone else have to hear your conversation. That, that is evil itself. I'm totally convinced of that. You know, I'm, I'm actually somewhat uh, guilty of this uh, right now because I forgot to bring my headphones. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I accept that I'm evil. And uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Um, okay, well, nobody said anything quick enough. So now I guess you get more of me. This is your punishment. <laughs> Hopefully you will learn your lesson <laughs> next time and you will speak up. Uh, so uh, God, I could really just dive into Nevit, you bringing up multiplicity and like the nature of multiplicity makes me just want to, to, to go buck wild and start talking about my problems with multiplicity. But, but I want to just talk about Shelling for a second. I think that, Nevin, you pointed out something that's really interesting to me. That, that you pointed out a counter argument to what I'm saying, which I think is what Schelling would say, but then I developed, or I didn't develop, but I, I was reminded of, I think, a problem with that. Okay, so basically, I'm saying, or I'm, I'm, I'm arguing that, yes, I agree with you, Chase, and I agree with you, Nevin, that this striving towards a unity, imposing oneself as God, right, um, this, this ultimately ill-fated desire to become a god oneself, right? Uh, I think that, I think that the question in my mind is, okay, Schelling, okay, Schelling, how do you do it? How do you strive for unity without dipping into evil? How do you do, how are you, how is your unity not evil? You see what I'm saying? And his argument would be, Oh, well, well, because the unity that I'm talking about is spirithood, which is uh, the, the unity that comes in spirithood is a result of unity's connection with God and light and its ability to go above light and darkness because it's spirit and it's connected to God and all this. And so his, his unity, <coughs> excuse me, <laughs> is, is given to, to, to the subject through God. <laughs> and, and my, 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 rebuttal i suppose or my my response my my new my new fear i guess you could call it right is that is that this god this springing up of the word this 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 uh spilling out of god into the self as spirit right i guess at a certain point it seems like 
I really, I'm really, really, really not trying to make, like I, I'm trying to say this in, the, in a way that is in no way dismissive of any of these first principles at all. But I, am je I really want to question one of the pre basic fundamental presuppositions of Schelling's argument here without trying to be like uh, rude about it, I guess, to Schelling. <laughs> and it's that I worry about this word or this God in its, in its motivations. And it's, I worry about the reasoning behind, I, I worry about the, 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 the undeniable solid basis that I could be given as to why this word or God arises at all and why it comes towards the individual and wh or why it fills and overflows the individual and so on. Uh, and why it does what it does when it does what it does. And if I can, if I can kind of point to a, par, a point, a point in the reading that, that kind of, I guess, describes what I'm talking about in a less abstract and, and weird way, it's page 33. I'm looking at page 33 right now. Uh, on page 33, he starts really confronting the problem of evil. Or not, he doesn't start really confronting the problem of evil, but but he's trying to he's trying to like specify here at the start of this paragraph in page 33. He says, we say expressly the possibility of evil. We're seeking at the moment to make intelligible, intelligible only the severability of the principles. The reality of evil is the object of a whole other investigation. The principle raised up from the ground of nature, whereby man is separated from God, right? That is, is the selfhood in him which, however, through its unity with the ideal principle becomes spirit, selfhood as such is spirit, or man is spirit, as a selfish particular, I don't know how to speak German, so I'm not gonna, as a selfish particular being separated from God, precisely this connection constitutes personality, right? Since selfhood is spirit, however, is at the same time raised from the creaturely, this personality, into what is above the creaturely. It is will that beholds itself in complete freedom, being no longer an instrument of the productive universal will in nature, but rather above and outside of all nature. Spirit is above the light, as in nature it raises itself above the unity of the light and the dark principle. Since it is spirit, selfhood is therefore free from both principles, right? My, my, my basic problem, or at least one of my basic problems, is that Schelling regards this as a sort of, this is an example, I think, of Schelling seeing this tension, this tension that maintains itself, this sort of Jungian duality of opposites, this sort of misreading, or I guess, or like proto version of Hegel's notion of the coincidence of opposites. Okay, and, 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 and basically he's saying that we are, not only are we individual unique particular little uh, creatures, we're unique particular creatures and we're stuck within our creaturely subjective perspective, but at the same time we're connected to, to, uh, to uh, God. Uh, the grand nature whereby man is separated from God is the selfhood in him. He's separated from God. There is this, uh, the, 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 this separation from God leaves selfhood as spirit. Uh, this, this thing connected to spirit. It's this, this part of God or this relationship with God or the word. Okay? How is it that, or I guess this is his explanation of how it is that the spirit or the or the self the individual can be this unique particular individual who also has access to this spirithood or whatever but i think his description of spirit is weird i guess is my own is my big problem it's a weird idea of of self right self being contaminated or wrong or or or, yeah, that, that's, I agree. I, I don't get how anything can be above both principles in his metaphysics. I'm kind of with you a little bit, and that's kind of aiding in my, in my naivete, which is why a Schelling expert would probably lambast me. But I'm saying, he's saying that the problem is that we're, we're creaturely. There's a problem, and it's that we're creaturely. The solution is that we are connected to God, and that 
God raises us above the creaturely and above the dark, the darkness and the light, right? <clears throat> this, I think, echoes, again, his notion of spirithood allowing us to unify the multiplicity to wrangle up the opposites, to, to, to find the, the poetic center, to, to, and, and not to find like um, the overall total one, but like we said, to find the centrum, to find the fundamental core of these ideas, which is just, I, in my opinion, and I, I really, I'm not trying to like be, you know, flippant, but it just seems like it's re it's changing the local the locality of the problem. It's changing the the it's re localizing the problem into this centrum, this this center of being, which which I can recognize. But but if I can kind of respond to Schelling here, <clears throat> it feels like it feels like he's trying to overcome the particularity and and argue for a contact with the absolute. He's arguing for a notion of contact with the absolute in spite of our particularity. I think it is Hegel, and I think it is Hegelian dialectics, and I think it is Hegel's notion of spirit, which gives us a, a different perspective, which is that we are not overcoming particularity, difference, pure difference, multiplicity, and finding unity. We are instead given access to this notion or to the becoming of the absolute and to unity in disparity, in, in difference, in particularity. And it's why, it's why God, it's why God comes to earth as Jesus. God comes to earth as Christ, and we can only relate to God through Christ. Christ is a fallible, human, mortal man. He is a finite, individual, particular consciousness. God, basically, in Schelling's terms, if I can talk in Schelling ease, God comes to humanity as a creature. God comes to humanity in a creaturely form, in, in, in a creaturely body. And it is not that God transcends this creaturely body, but it is that his, yeah, Deleuzian Hegel, yes, finally, Deleuzian Hegelianism. That's exactly what I've been waiting for all these years. Um, but I, I, I think that, we are supposed to relate to God because he's creaturely. We're supposed to, God celebrates our division. Christ comes and says, do you remember those? Okay, Nevin, you're, you've read the Bible at least once. I never have, but you probably remember the part where uh, he talks about um, if you are not an enemy of your mother and your daughter and your sister and your father and your brother, then you're not a follower of me, right? And then Kierkegaard has to reckon with that. And Kierkegaard talks about that a lot. Is like, you have to be, and Kierkegaard argues that that's because you have to be willing to commit any atrocity, to commit any sort of violence or, or abandon your ethical principles. You have to be willing to transcend the mortal world of appearances for love for me, to prove your love to me, to, to engender your love for me, to embody love for God. You have to be willing, ready, and able to go against your mother and your father and so on. But yes, yes, Kierkegaard and Trump support, exactly. Teleological suspension of the ethical. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Yes, and, it's, and the story of Abraham. They ever ah, haha, my people. Um, <laughs> but uh, basically, I think that I think that Hegel has a different reading of that same quote. I think that Hegel would would argue that the reading is not just that there's a teleological suspension of the ethical, right? But <laughs> but the but the the very gap. This this thing that 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 Schelling on page on page whatever the the page that I was just on talking about personality that I have now completely lost and forgotten because I'm I'm a doddering old fool. Uh, <laughs> my point is that the, the the separation itself is the key to to understanding. To, to speculative thought, to, to reconciliation of opposites, to, to speculative unity of opposites. It's, it's, it's understanding and accepting and embodying this, this separation, this gap, this fundamental gap. And Schelling reckons with that gap and he sees the gap and he is a, like, it seems like he's like afraid of it. 
And he's saying like, no, 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 we, we, we can overcome that gap in some sense. And my argument is basically just no, like, I don't think we can. I don't think we can overcome the gap. I don't think there's any way to overcome the gap. I think that the gap itself is the only absolute we have. The gap itself is the only, is the only real absolute that we can deal with. I think that Schelling is just kind of misplacing his attention here and is relying too much on this notion of the word and of the logos and of the God and its, imbo and its embodiment in spirithood and in selfhood. And my only real problem with that is that it seems kind of arbitrary. It seems kind of arbitrary. And because of that, it doesn't satisfy me. And the only thing that does satisfy me is to change the question entirely. And to say maybe we should just focus on the on the division itself, on the gap, on the cut, on the on the on the, on the, the ontological impossibility as epistemological limitation, basically. Which I'm sorry for speaking as much as I did. But. I'm gonna listen to all these recordings and make a religion out of hunterism. <laughs> no. Uh. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I agree with a, a lot of that critique. Um, although I wonder, it's, well, especially in his account of, you know, this notion of spirit that kind of goes above the, the two principles. Um, I, I see kind of, at least I think I see kind of what he's trying to do there by associating that with selfhood. And then, you know, selfhood is then this principle that uh i don't even know if you'd consider it a principle in the technical term but um but that you know selfhood is plays this very important role and i think the way that spirit is something that's it's equivalent with um selfhood for for humans at least i think and also from uh, separation from God, and also a kind of, so I'm gonna just somewhat kind of read these notes on the side that I made, and also a will that beholds itself in complete freedom. So basically this seems to be where he's really making the case that freedom is the ability to do evil essentially which you know then goes into the whole thing about willing itself to be that universal uh you know it's separation and it's uh you know it takes itself as selfhood to be the universal instead of um i don't know what the the total ground of or, or something of all these things that is the universal, I, I'm not totally sure, but I think what's confusing, so, so that part is kind of confusing to me, even though I see kind of why he needs to, to make that move. But then uh, if I were to like somewhat try to make the case for Schelling to try to get into his head and, and see what he's doing, because it definitely seemed to me like he's too much, he is kind of saying that, you know, this is about going beyond the creaturely and the particular to some degree. But I think there's a important qualification we can make to that in the sense that he's not saying that uh, the particular or the creaturely in itself is evil. And, you know, he talks about animals in here and says that you know, they don't really have the capacity for evil, but yet they're not exactly, you know, spirit themselves or whatnot. But yeah, they're never outside of unity. You know, they're creaturely. So, which I think kind of goes into the way that he does have this, uh, I don't know, tension is the right word, but the way that he supposes this balance works between division and and the unity i guess you could say but the fact that it's a kind of emphasis of the creaturely um that emphasizes 
its separation as the universal, I think that's what he's really saying. That's what evil is. Um, and that the creaturely itself, the particular itself, isn't so much a problem, but I guess it sort of creates the conditions or the, the possibilities of that problem. I'm sure all these terms are technically wrong, but uh, at least that's how I, I somewhat uh, believe that Schelling would kind of answer that. Although uh, I still uh, would have to kind of somewhat side with Hunter on this. And that yeah, I don't know if, if is what he's trying to do, you know, just to the the old fashioned kind of, you know, creaturely thing is bad. I don't really know. He says so he does uh, talk about people that say, you know, the uh, that the material or the sensual is evil. He he goes into uh, quite a bit about that, especially in this part towards the end of our reading where he talks about Kant and he criticizes him uh, quite a bit. And it's part of that notion of where he's saying that, yeah, this idea of just the sensual itself or animality itself, that's not what we're talking about. It's something unique that comes with with humans and and human ability to uh for freedom in some sense and i would say you know some kind of like abstract thought as well that can make these de determinations about universality and particularity and all the things that we're talking about but um yeah i guess that's my that's my case so here, here's my general thought. It, it, it seems like you need some sort of principle of unity if you have any kind of um, opposites or diversity or anything like that. Um, I mean, I, I don't really think in terms of opposites. I think, you know, partially because of Nietzsche, I think in terms of just diversity of there being, you know, there being incoherent principles that are moving in different directions, not necessarily oppositely, but just moving in different directions and that are often incompatible with one another. And so if, if, it, if the ground of reality is something like pure difference or something like pure differentiation, then there has to be some principle of unity in order for there to be anything because things are Nom, you know, things are provisional unities. I mean, they don't last for very long, but everything is, is a provisional unity. A self is a provisional unity. And so there has to be some explanation for why there are unified things. Now, Hunter, I don't really understand exactly. And again, I don't think it's because your ideas are incoherent, because I just, they're too, um, they're very dense and and I mean, you know, and so on. But I, I get the impression that you're un, that in terms of unity. So this could be wrong. You're unhappy that Schelling wants to say the principle of of unity is extrinsic to the thing. That so that if there is some concept or something that the the unity and the diversity are integrated together, and so you don't need it an extrinsic principle of unity, whereas Schelling one seems to want to say, yeah, things are as they are manifestations of this ground, you know, this, this chaotic ground, they need some principle of unity. And for him, that principle of unity is extrinsic to those things, at least the, the legitimate one, you know, one that can maintain unity without becoming evil and that extrinsic principle is god um and and you know again so then again i'm i'm, tr I'm trying to think of or it reminds me of both kierkegaard and, and nietzsche kierkegaard would agree with Schelling that the human spirit or the human soul he makes a distinction between soul and spirit which i don't remember at the moment cannot maintain this unity without 
grounding it in, in, the, in the divine. Nietzsche, on the other hand, says, if you have, if you have within yourself one particular force, the dominating instinct that is strong enough, that force within yourself can be the, the, the you know, can be what unifies all the rest, all this diversity into a coherent, unified personality. Um, but he, you know, like Nietzsche, I think, for, thinks that most of us are not capable of doing that. And so then we have to rely also upon extrinsic principles in order to maintain the unity of our personalities. But for, for Nietzsche, those extrinsic principles are things like the herd, the her herd morality, social morality, these moral norms that enforce behavioral restrictions upon us and make it and, and sort of force us to, to uh, not give not give expression to all that chaotic diversity because if we do, we'll be punished for it. And so there is the, these social and moral norms that 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 sort of encapsulate individuality and keep it unified. But for the person who has that principle within himself, he doesn't need that. But so and I don't know where that fits in with this, I, but that's that's still so. You, so I guess for Nietzsche, you could, there's most people need an extrinsic principle of unity. Some people have an internal principle of unity. For it sounds like for Kierkegaard and Schelling, they both think that we can't do that, and so that there has to be a universal, you know, some divine principle of unity, and there has to be a principle of unity. I would think also be if everything everything in phenomena is a manifestation of that ground, then everything that exists as a unity, even if it's a, a temporary unity, like all physical things are temporary, but they have a, a, a temporary transient unity, and there must be some principle that holds those together, which is exactly why you have Aristotelian form or Platonic form or something of that sort that can hold the unity so, you know, for Plato, the receptacles like this, this chaos and the form is what maintains that chaos into a structured entity for a period of time. But no, I what I'm, all I'm saying is you, you, ha, you need some kind of principle of unity. And, and would you, would you, I mean, is your primary beef with Schelling then to say that you don't need an extrinsic principle of unity because things themselves are unities within that diversity i oh okay so um this is kind of what i talked about earlier when i was like god don't make me talk about multiplicity because i have a bunch of notes about multiplicity and they're extra boring but uh basically i i, I think that i think that if you can give me an extrinsic principle of unity that is good if you can give me a, like an extrinsic principle of unity that is like a good one that I, I buy, I'll buy it, you know, but, but, but I, I, I don't, I don't find Schelling's extrinsic principle of unity to be necessarily, um, necessarily convincing. And so the, all, all I can believe is the Hegelian, uh, at least all, all that I've been able to be convinced of, you know, um, how is the, oh, well, his, his, his ex, ex, explicit or, or extrinsic principle of unity, it's, 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 I think that his, his notion of the word, I think that his, his, his process of interaction between, between the one and, and the individual, I think that when he talks about oneness, as like as like the eternal one and the eternal recurring one or the reference self reference of the one you know this this like like when he says that uh it's the it's the eternal one or whatever giving birth to itself or trying to give birth to itself that sort of eternal one it's it's my my problem yeah i there was a lot of there was a lot of stuff about the word that i didn't grasp onto immediately but what i did grasp onto was was just this this um i guess it was it was this it was this it, okay 
the, the, the simplest I can put it that I can come up with or that I can actually like put it to myself even is that Schelling has an idea of the word coming to be. The word or the one coming to be out of a ground and that ground is the gap, right? That I can understand to some extent, but I fear, I fear that like, yeah, 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 I, I also, I get that. It's like a, yeah, a Gnostic emphasis on the revelation of God in the ground. I, I, I feel like, like, and this is just because I've heard of the one described in a different way, which I agree with more. This is the, like the reason why I'm saying this. I, I is what reason is to the absolute. Now, is, for, is it, the word is to God, and Schelling is to what reason is to the absolute. In Hegel, I, I, I feel like the word in the word God in Schelling comes about, right? But but the difference, the difference between the word in Schelling and reason in Hegel. Is that, is that I think that Schelling sees God as the material of reality. God, Schelling sees God as the word and as logos, as the, very, as the very substance of reality. Schelling sees God as a substance. That's a, okay. Schelling sees God or the word or logos as this substantial, this substantial, uh, substrate, I suppose, for reality. Hegel would argue something different. I feel like Hegel would say, Hegel overcame Kant in the same way that, that, that Schelling tried to, or they both tried to overcome Kant. Hegel tried to co overcome Kant, Schelling came, oh, tried to overcome Kant in this similar way of, 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 of arguing about the one and about, and about how it's possible to know, really know what's out there, right? I think that I think that Hegel's interpretation of the one or of reason, right, is that it is explicitly not one. The the one, the absolute, the 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 thing, it's 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 the thing beyond appearance. And if it is in appearance, then it's not one. And, and so the, the noble one is not one. It is the ultimate thing that cannot be what it is. It, it, it is a purely formal one. It's, it's so not one. Kant would say that the universe is not one. Kant would say that the universe is not one in the sense that we can't know what's out there. There's a noumenal world of stuff we can't understand. There's always gonna be this gap between the one and the actuality of reality, the actual totality. There's always gonna be a gap between the one and the totality. Kant would say that because of the noumenal world that we can understand. Schelling would say, no, there is one. It is the one. This is the one. The one is God. And the only thing that's not one in God is the ground. That's the only thing that's not one in, 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 is the ground from which God sprang. But Hegel would say, whoa, 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 whoa. It's not, I, like Hegel would say, I agree I agree, yeah, 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 separate and co-emerging. I think that Hegel would say, I agree, Kant, the reality is not one, but not in the sense that it's beyond my ability to make it one. It's not just beyond my ability to unify it. It is explicitly, directly, actively, very actively not one. It is an act against one. It is a it is a dissolvement of oneness. It is it is an opposition to oneness with a presupposition from the moment, from the instant that it exists. The 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 one is is gone against. We go against the one as soon as as soon as things start, as soon as the story starts, there's a presupposition that there is a one. And so the, the one that we experience is a not one. It's a very active not one. It's it's reality is the things that aren't the one, you know, the things that aren't able to be what they are. And and that comes through with, and this is why I'm I'm on this weird I, I yeah, well 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 it's a it's a false unity in the sense that it's it's our experience. I'm almost in this weird camp. I swear to God, I'm 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 in this like Hegel is almost like a process philosopher or like a post-process philosopher or something. Like it's just 
I'm totally like off my rocker. I'm losing my mind and I know that. But, but basically, if, if I can talk about, about unity, about concepts of unity, I think that we're <laughs> like this extrinsic concept of unity or this extrinsic uh, principle of unity, which is God or the word. Uh, yeah, yes. In, in, in Schelling, this answer to Kant's, what's, why, is he, why is reality such a not one? Uh, Schelling saying it is one. Schelling produces this external uh, principle of unity. I think that Hegel presents a principle of unity to the multiplicity. I, I, I know, again, I see like, yeah, of course, from the Hegel guy, Hegel has an answer for everything. But Hegel, I'm, I'm serious, conveys an internal principle of unity, a self-referential imminent principle of, of unity through the notion of abbreviation. Uh, oh, I'm actually interested in his, his I, now Nevin, I'm, I'm, since you said in the chat, I'm interested in his de delineation between God himself and he himself. Because actually, I think that might illuminate and make me, you know, that might illuminate kind of some of the problems that I'm seeing and might, might reveal why I'm having problems is because I probably am misunderstanding parts of Schelling's argument, if I'm being completely honest. Um, yeah, it's a myth. Uh, I, I think that basically, just to, just to end, Hegel has a notion of unity and that unity is abbreviation and this abbreviation comes in the form of the borders, the borders of multiplicities, like in a pack of wolves. It's very similar to the way that a pack of wolves work in becoming an animal, in a sense. And I can talk about the difference between becoming animal and becoming an animal and the, the curse of the family and genus and abbreviation through borders and all this hoogie do. But my basic point is that Hegel has a non-extrinsic principle of unity, and I agree with it more currently. That's it. So I, maybe it's a, a quibble. I wanted to say, or part of some of my comments were suggesting he doesn't, I don't think he thinks that creatures are grounded in God, at least not God proper. And I think, you know, part of the distinction is that, you know, the, these two modes, I don't know what to call them, modes of God, but there is like this, this the, the ground and God somehow, you know, self-generating each other or mutually generating each other. And so that's like God as ontological ground. But then there's also this God, I guess, as something like, I don't know if it's God as personality or something like that, but God is the manifestation of unity of the yearning. And so it's like there's this aspect of God which is co-generating the ground, and that ground is this ground of, of diversity, you know, this chaos and so on. But then there's this, I don't know if it's an aspect of God that is a manifestation for the uni, union of, for, the, for unity, for the emergence of unity. And I'm thinking those are the two different aspects of God. And so since everything is a manifestation of the ground, you could say that things are manifestations of that God in the sense of co-creating that anarchic ground. But then, but then insofar as things are unities, they have to be unified in this aspect of God, which is a manifestation of the yearning for unity. So there's like these two aspects of God, God one which is, is at one with the, the anarchic chaos, and one that is a manifestation of the yearning for unity. It, that's what it sounds like he's, and I, again, I can say these words, Hume's com complaint would be, yeah, you can say those words, but they don't make any sense. I don't know. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. But then I think that the ground of unity then for, for the cosmos is that second aspect that is a manifestation of this yearning for, yearn, yearn, yearning for unity. And that when we, or any, when we, I guess maybe we're the only ones that are capable of doing this, when we try to be principles of unity ourselves independently of that, then that's when we get evil somehow. And and I don't, and so it, you know, like Chase was saying, he really wants to say that the, the, that there is a real sort of will to evil to sort of, you know, use a Nietzschean phrase and there is a will to good. Uh, whereas, you know, the, some of the theologies he's complaining about, uh, you can't really say there is a will to evil, but he thinks there is. 
Um, you know, and the will to evil is again this will to sort of break off from from that whole system and become your own unity, or as like Eric was saying, become God. Um, and that's that's what evil is. It, and I, I'll be interested it to see if he has any explanation for why anyone would do that. And my suspicion, and he is it that he's going to go the go the route of Augustine and Kierkegaard. Kierkegaard and saying there is no reason people that people just choose and if you say why it's because they choose that's my guess because he's he may end up with the same problem that Augustine has which is you know if you ask Augustine you know because so again for Augustine to uh, evil is when you when you love the world more than God and good is when you love God more than evil I mean, more than the world. So there isn't any evil. It's just that it's which direction your will is inclined. And if you ask Augustine, well, why did we do one or the other? He goes, there's no answer to that question. We just do. And I'm wondering if he's going to end up in that with that same kind of problem that, yeah, there's freedom of the will and freedom. Unlike Augustine, you know, Augustine, there is no, you don't choose evil. You just, you just choose to love things more than God, but maybe for Maybe the difference is that he would say, yeah, you have this sort of arbitrary choice, but instead of being just choosing away from God, you're actually choosing this positive uh, principle of, of radical individuation, something like that. Uh, so can I, can I jump in real quick and, and say a bunch of random things? Because I've kind of been, been sitting on some ideas and I don't know how relevant they are anymore because I've, I've kind of like lost the thread and picked it back up several times at this point. Uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, oh God, where was I gonna start? Right, so so one thing is just a um, annoyance that I have and it's an annoyance with shelling, not with necessarily anything going on here. I really hate it when philosophers just assume that animals like can't be evil or can't participate in the moral sphere or can't like like there's no argument for this anywhere he's just assuming that that it this is only applies to humans and and there there's like there's no investigation of animals there's no there's no like uh consideration of what kind of principles would be relevant to that kind of discussion or how would we how would we know for certain that they aren't uh, you know moral agents who can do the type of thing that he's describing in the same way that humans can't it's i find this like incredibly and like what i think the first uh philosopher that i really encountered this with was uh, bertrand russell and it's just it really just wants to make me sock someone in the face it's it's like completely intellectually incurious um in the worst possible way so that's like a pet peeve um i wanted to talk about spinoza's conception of evil um, and uh, this is where I'm like, I don't know how relevant this is because it, it, it might be kind of relevant to some of what's going on here. Um, I'm getting this from um, the Deleuze's commentary on the, on the, I think it's pronounced Blyburn, Blightburn, I'm not certain, letters, uh, which is basically Spinoza had a series of an exchange of letters with this, um, I believe he was a Calvinist, uh, who, was, who was asking him about his conception of evil and Spinoza was sort of um, outlining it and kind of gradually, gradually Spinoza realized that the guy isn't really asking him questions in good faith. Um, so it's a very, it's a very interesting sort of series of, of letters to take a look at. What Spinoza ends up arguing is that evil is relational. Um, evil is a kind of thing that happens when a certain type of relation, uh, ex you know, comes into being or, or exists between two different entities. Right, two different. Uh, oh God, I'm trying to keep my terminology state straight. It's been so long. I've actually, done this stuff. As as I believe that's um, uh, modes. Ah, God. Uh, but two different entities, at the very least, they they come into cer a certain kind of contact or relation, and that's what uh, results in. And you know, insofar as we're interested in this question of like unity or um, uh, questions of like. Uh, like maybe a pr different prevailing unities, like a specific unity that's, uh, you know, relative to God versus the type of unity that, you know, Nietzsche would say a particular human tries to enact uh, uh, within themselves or a society enacts upon particular human beings. Spinoza, Spinoza doesn't think that any of that is like actually sensible. 
like like that it that it can make sense in a sort of discussion of evil because every time that you come into a particular kind of relation with something it represents a certain kind of unity um and he gives the example you poison someone well the process of being poisoned is a kind of unity it's arguably a kind of evil like it sucks to be poisoned and we don't like it when we're poisoned but we're coming into a certain kind of unity with the poison um, and that is enacting itself in a certain kind of state of an affair, as a certain kind of body comes into existence at that particular moment, which is a body that is poisoned. Um, so, so part of what Spinoza would criticize, I think, specifically about um, uh, Schelling's perspective is, first of all, this idea that the question of unity can fully explain the presence of evil. Um, Spinoza might agree that, that it is the conflict between different unities that you could characterize as a kind of evil, right? Like I come into a certain, kind, he, he actually, he gives this explicit example of, of um, uh, this is a, I, I find this one really weird. Uh, uh, throwing uh, two spiders, um, or like throwing one spider into another spider's web. And then they, they uh, come into conflict with each other and, and you know, one of them kills the other um, because, you know, they're occupying each other's space. And so they, they bring, one bring death, brings death to the other at that point. But, you know, so you could say, oh, well, that's one order, the order of a, of a particular body, a spider, coming into a contact with another order, the other spider, and then, and then resulting in a certain kind of conflict, which, um, which ultimately results in death for one of the entities, which you could conceive of, and, you know, Spinoza thinks that this is, this is what we would think of as evil. Um, but, at, right, at each of those stages, right, so, you know, the, the two uh, spiders battling, uh, one of them winning, maybe one of them eating the other, right? Whatever point that you reach in this sort of step, each of those represents a kind of unifying or a kind of uh, inter you know, internal relationship to the system that is this pair of spiders coming into conflict. Um, and so to the extent that I think I'm, I'm interested in agreeing with, with um, aspects of, of Hunter's Hegelian analysis, it's, it's to say, well, this emphasis on a, on a kind of godly unity um, is an emphasis on a, a specific metaphysical ordering um, that is, uh, you know, A, arguably immoral. I mean, there's, uh, the, oh God, this joke that I saw recently uh, that I really loved was, uh, you know, uh, contemporary uh, communists, atheists, uh, uh, 18th and early 19th century communists. Uh, I hate God, and when I get into heaven, I'm going to unionize the angels, uh, right? This kind of, like, specific kind of uh, uh, theological relationship where you, um, you go, well, actually, things should be multiplicitous in the sense that um, it, there's a democratic character to it, and this overarching emphasis on God's will or of a prevailing order um, above other types of unities, above other types of coming into to relationships. I mean, this is why, not to be overly Deleuzian, and I was trying to avoid that because I wanted to talk about Spinoza, but um, uh, this is why uh, Deleuze wants to abandon any kind of discussion of, of the multiple and the one in favor of multiplicity is because there are all of these different possible relations which can come together at particular moments. Um, and, and, you know, to the extent that any of that represents evil, Spinoza thinks that that is, uh, that persists in the destruction and the elimination of power, um, which is, we can get into an interesting conversation about what Spinoza means by power. I, I, I find that particularly interesting. Um, but it doesn't have anything to do with um, a, a specific prevailing order because, right, the world is constantly shifting. Um, it has to do with the capacity for whatever specific ordering emerges at a particular moment to continue to be fecund and continue to be productive and to continue to produce uh, a kind of power rather than collapsing or, or uh, resulting in a destructive or an eliminative combination. I'd be curious for thoughts on that as an alternative, either to this Nietzschean system or to this Hegelian, or not the Hegel, the Schelling. I, it might actually agree with the Hegelian system. I'm not certain, but uh, uh, certainly the the Nietzschean or the Schelling, Schellingian, Schellingly. I don't know. Either of those two conceptualizations. This is kind of a vague response, but I, 
you know, sometimes when I think about um, notions of evil as something like uh, dis, you know, being out of tune, like I'm thinking like Plato or Aristotle, you know, that there really is no evil. There's just um, when the soul is out of tune, you know, when an appetite becomes too strong or something like that. Um, and I, I really don't know, understand um, Spinoza's notion of evil at all, you know, so, but sometimes what people will say is that those kinds of notions of evil don't seem to really get at things like the Holocaust or things like people who torture people just for fun, you know. So those sorts of things seem not to be misattunements or misalignments. They seem to be something nastier and grittier and more awful. And, and so I think one of the appeals of e evil as an act of choice against good is to account for, and it does seem like only people do that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, cats play with their food, but that's, you know, and they, they will play with a mouse before they eat it, but those are grounded in natural instincts, which is, you know, similar to what something Schelling says, it's hard to say that that's evil. It's just something that we find sort of distasteful, but, you know, people will do things like hang people from hooks and, and slice them up until they bleed to death. And um, that kind of evil, at least some people say, needs, needs some sort of deeper explanation. So on that, that last bit, I, I find that to be blatantly circular reasoning, right? You're saying, okay, so we have this example of human beings uh, you know, tormenting someone, and that looks evil to me. And then we have this example of cats, and they're tormenting something, and that doesn't seem evil to me. Like, why don't we attribute malice to cats? You know, that's the question that I'm that I'm interested in. Um, the, the, the assumption is that animals can't choose otherwise. Right, but why but, assume that? <laughs> um, um, I'm not going to say necessarily that I, I don't. Th I'm not, I'm just. I'm a bit like I don't. I don't have like a real argument here. It's just like two things. First off, I don't get um, I don't get social anxiety, or in a room full of dogs or babies, in a, in the same way that I do in a room full of men or and women and children and humans. You know what I mean? Like I don't I don't care about yeah <laughs> I don't care about dogs looking at me and when they look they gaze into me it is not the same as a human being gazing into me, and the reason is that. I am relatively confident that neither dogs nor babies are capable of two fa functions that I commonly hear regarded as parts of being a person. And that's symbolizing abstractly and uh, seeking fulfillment. Uh, I think that dogs, dogs and cats, I don't know. I mean, maybe they do. I have no proof, I suppose. I have no, I don't have no, I have no undeniable evidence that dogs do not seek out fulfillment and want to fulfill their dreams of chasing a big juicy steak all day or something, or like, you know, that they, that they, that they, maybe they do symbolize abstractly. Maybe they think of me as some sort of character. Yes, maybe the, yes, maybe they're currently symbolizing. Maybe they're currently regarding us in a certain way and thinking of us as these, this particular symbol that we're fitting into. I don't know. I can't talk to one and I'm, you know, I just, I guess I've always assumed so. And that's because I'm a, I'm a Luddite or something. I, don't know. I think it's, it's a failure to employ a very simple, like a frankly, very conservative philosophical principle, which is this, if you don't know, well, you probably shouldn't presumptively assert, right? Like if we don't know for sure that animals don't have these capacities, if it's even questionable, if you could sit down and I have done this, I have looked my cats in the eye and been like, yeah, okay, I could see you judging me right now. I could see I could see a certain kind of social relationships occurring right now. I mean, I don't know exactly what's going on in your head, but I, I know you react to what I'm doing and thinking and saying and, uh, uh, you know, and have certain social expectations of me that the food should arrive on time, um, that you have things that you're particularly interested in acquiring or doing, uh, that cats have individualistic personalities, right? As, you know, as a specific sort of example, whether or not that accedes to the level that uh, human beings experience, I, 
I don't know. Does it not accede to it in a morally relevant way? I don't know. Well, if the answer is I don't know, which for me it is, and it sounds like for all of you it is, then it seems like the, the philosophically conservative thing to do, and I, I know this is very much tangential, so I apologize, but it seems like the philosophically conservative thing to do is just to not talk about the problem or not talk about that specific question unless it is important, relevant, or you've decided that it that a certain philosophical problem swings on it to flippantly go, oh, well, I just think that, that uh, you know, animals can't behave in this particular kind of way. And so they can't be moral, morally relevant seems to me to be like, like incredibly philosophically uh, 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 ungrounded and ridiculous. Um, that all being said, I, I did want to say with like, with respect to the overall point, I, I don't think that that, that uh, Spinoza is quite talking about the problem in that particular kind of way um, in terms of like a, a deficiency. Um, uh, when he's talking about the elimination of, of like powers, I, I, I think one good thing to kind of think about there is, is maybe like a certain kind of impotence, right? Like, uh, and, and I, I think we all understand that with respect to like maybe a discussion, for instance, of, of okay, so we're trying to understand fascists and, and, and why they behave in the particular way that they do. Why do they do these incredibly evil things? Well, one way of talking about it is that that is a certain kind of impotence in, in that people are drawn to a, kind, a certain kind of violence and a, a certain kind of hatred of others um, uh, because of an inability to uh, you know, like integrate those pieces of of external society in them to themselves to deal with internal problems they have to deal with their external relationship to society as a whole they begin identifying elements of it and and developing this sort of destructive and visceral rage against it which i, I you know i find a more compelling explanation of, of a certain type of behavior but then again as we got as was discussed sort of last time i mean it, you know there was this whole um uh sort of uh uh what's the word I'm looking for here, digression as to whether or not Spinoza is a, you know, a, a determinist or a fatalist, right? And, and my assertion is, is that, you know, a Spinoza's philosophy is at the very least fatalist um, in the sense that it, it thinks that a, a certain sort of circumstances is the inevitable result of um, uh, the kind of possibilities present within God. Um, but I think he, he might even be determinist in the sense that, well, obviously, it is the interaction of certain powers, right? Of, of like of like bits and pieces of a of a. Um, uh, I'll have to ask you about that, Chase. Of of a larger sort of puzzle and a lar larger sort of like like uh, cosmic structure that result in a particular um, configuration of uh, as arriving at a particular kind of moment, right? It might be true that certain people choose to be evil, but that choice to be evil is grounded in a certain kind of relationship. Am I just mic dropping at the end? We're like 22 minutes over, so I apologize. I think so. Yeah, I, I have to go. My <laughs> phone is about to die. Okay. Before we adjourn, wait, hey, Chase. Yes. You coming over? Yes. Good. Okay, that's all. Logistics. A threesome. Oh, yeah. We're going to record it. <laughs> you, you young guys. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So, shall we close it up for tonight? Yeah. Thank you. That was very interesting. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.